This is a presentation on the artist Elizabeth Jane Gardner. Her years are 1837 to 1922, and I want to tell you about her lifetime in art and business. I want to introduce you to an American artist of the second half of the 19th century, one that I think should be more well known today. Her name is Elizabeth Jane Gardner, and she was well known and very successful in her own time, but somewhat overlooked now. She was very talented, she was ambitious, very determined, and she navigated her way through the obstacles that faced women in her lifetime in the art world. This is a, a short review of her early life and artistic training, and then we'll look at her artistic reputation and output. We'll examine her style, the subject matter, and her contemporaries. We'll find out how she made a living and how did she approach the entire business of art. In conclusion, what can we say is her legacy? and how should her contributions be judged. Um, to make it more interesting, I'm going to sprinkle a few of her work throughout the presentation, which I think are certainly very pleasant. And then I will also look at another um, artwork more fully. To give you a snapshot of um, what Ms. Gardner kind of looked like, we see these three images, photographs on the um, right and left, showing her as a young artist and as a much older woman, both in their studio, showing her in her profession. The one in the middle is her um, is a portrait by her fiance, William Bouguereau, and that was done in 1879 when she was 42 years old. Um, her passport description said, called her five feet, two inches tall with gray eyes, brown hair, a light complexion, an oval face, a big nose, large mouth, small chin, and high forehead. And I would just say, I'm glad we don't have these kinds of passport descriptions any longer. This slide shows the area that she lived in in Paris for most of her time there. Um, after she went there to get training and live her life, she lived there really for the rest of her life, which was over 50 years. She uh, returned to the U.S. just a couple of times. Um, but her expat neighbors in her artist neighborhood, Paris included, James McNeil Whistler, Elizabeth North, and John Singer Sargent. She was a very good company. And her future husband, William Adolphe Bouguereau, became her next door neighbor in 1871. When Imogene, her friend and traveling companion, returned to the U.S. in 1874, Elizabeth continued to live alone in the same apartment at Rue 75, uh, Notre Dame de Champs. And she lived with 26 birds, apparently, and her, her pet parrot, Coco. One of the main reasons that Imogene and Elizabeth went to Paris was to get training. And I've read reports to say that maybe Elizabeth was a little naive about this. So from an interview um, many years later, she said, I had never dreamed on quitting America that all Paris had not a studio nor a master who would receive me. I'd forgotten if I ever knew that the few French or foreign women then familiar to the salon of the Latin Quarter, like the women painters who had preceded them, were the wives, sisters, or daughters of painters, and it was in the ateliers of their kinfolk that they lived and worked. Uh, she wrote much later also about her experience. She said, when I found every Paris atelier closed to me, I resolved to follow Rosa Bonheur's example in a similar emergency. My hair was short, a fever had clipped it before I quit America. I applied to the Paris Police Department for permission to wear boys' clothes. It was readily granted. The great drawing school of Paris in the 60s and for long after was the government Gobelin Tapestry Factory. No woman had ever crossed its threshold as a student, nor had one ever applied for admission to its classes. Undaunted, I knocked at the door and was admitted to the Gobelin School. Not a professor objected. This subterfuge enabled me to study from life in the company of strong draftsmen. I am indebted to it for whatever virility my drawing may have. I will point out that everyone knew Elizabeth was a female. This was a way to work around this um, ban on having females working with males in a, in a nude class. So it was understood. It was just a way for, for everyone to work around this restriction. 
she did a lot of different things to get the training that she wanted. And as, as we mentioned, she was surprised that so many doors were closed to her based on her gender. But she cobbled together a bunch of different things. As a, She was a copyist by day in the museums, and then she um, tried to get evening life classes. In 1865, just a year or so after she came to Paris, she participated in a woman's studio. And she says, I have just joined a few young ladies who have an independent little studio the other side of the river. We hire our own models, buy our own coal, by our united energy, we have brought about what I have longed for all winter, an evening class. We have bought a splendid lamp to light our models, and we work usually four evenings in the week. Now, the copying work that she, they did during the day became uh, too difficult by mid-November of each year because it was just too cold to work in unheated, unheated museums. So she kept going out there to get more formal training. We mentioned that she got um, permission to work at the Goblins factory and her permit application to dress as a man said, I need to undertake serious studies in courses where women are not yet admitted. I therefore implore you to grant me the permission to disguise, disguise myself as a man for the unique purpose of following more freely my artistic studies. Along with gender issues, Elizabeth found that another obstacle for her was cost. As we know, she supported herself and um, you had to pay for private lessons and American men were allowed to train in the subsidized schools and academies at no cost, just the same as French citizens. But aside from cost alone, it was not until 1900 that the French schools let any women in at all. It was 1900 that Ecole de Beaux-Arts finally did open its first classes for women. Now they could also find training in the studios of recognized artists at a cost. Um, in 1867, she joined a sketching class at the Paris Botanical Gardens and Zoo to specifically improve her skills in animal painting. Um, after she had gained admittance to the mixed training at the Goblins factory, the Academy Julienne began admitting women as well and without the subterfuge of cross-dressing. So in early 1873, she also enrolled in Academy Julienne, a very well-known school at the time where men and women could now sketch the nude side by side. As other artists did at this time, Elizabeth aligned herself with separate teachers and mentors who really helped her develop her style and helped her in her career. She started out with Jean-Baptiste Ong Sissier. She called him a Frenchman of about 50. Tender and irritable, drawing is his forte, but his color is bad. But what she liked about him was that he provided live models four times a week. Uh, secondly, she went on to Hughes Merle, and that was with the uh, a government funded school. She said it was almost the only instruction founded for ladies as well as gentlemen. He, she was, he was listed as her instructor for her successful salon submissions of 1868 and 1869. He remained a lifelong mentor to her. Now, importantly, in 1879, she listed herself as a student of Murrow, as well as William Adolphe Bouguereau and Jules Lafivre. Her mentors, as seen in their work here, taught a salon academic traditional style of painting. That is what she liked and she excelled at and she stuck with that for the remainder of her career. Bouguereau, her neighbor, teacher, mentor, fiance, and eventual husband is the artist with which she, she is most associated. Um, it's often indistinguishable, their work. Uh, their studios were located across the street from each other and they live next door to each other. So we'll look at Bouguereau and Gardner and their works. On the left is a Bouguereau, on the right is Gardner. You can see similar subjects um, and similar painting styles. Um, often when a female artist had a close relationship with a well-known male artist as Bouguereau was, either personally or professionally, it was often assumed that the male did most of the work. I'm suggesting it was the opposite for this pair. Elizabeth may have provided the outdoor scene work and the hands and feet detailing, which she excelled at for Bouguereau. But we know they certainly were collaborators and they shared models. Um, and many saw the similarities of their work as evidence of her skill. One critic noted her paintings were scarcely inferior to his. Another observer said, not a few canvases of the one will assuredly be attributed to the other. 
But there was, of course, bitter reactions as well. She got a, uh, a salon medal in 1887. One reviewer said, there is not a single member of the jury of the salon who is not thoroughly acquainted with the circumstances of Gardner's medal and who is not aware of the effective artistic production accorded by Mr. Bouguereau to his charming next door neighbor. So let's take a few slides to look at her work. Her style, traditional academic style of accepted salon paintings at this time. That means generally smooth finish, not painterly. They are more romantic than realism. Often they were life size, but these were not history paintings. Compared to Bouguereau, they're almost indistinguishable in palette, scale of the figures, as I mentioned, often life size, and technique, but their subject matter differs in some ways. She produced about four large paintings a year. Bouguereau, on the other hand, produced hundreds in his lifetime. I suggest she may have been assisting him. She often painted in plein air and completed her work in the studio. Bouguereau never painted outside. So her subject matter tended to genre paintings depicting sentimental themes of family, innocence, and friendship. She often depicted interactions between children and adolescents and their mothers and children. Her, she did not depict men very often. Occasionally, there were some biblical scenes, and most often she used a rustic outdoor setting. And she saw this as a way of strengthening her image as a proper woman and that she was respecting the conventions of propriety. Her earliest success came in 1968 when she submitted two paintings to the salon and they were both accepted. She said in a correspondence to her family, but when the exhibition opened, both of mine were hung in full view among the accepted. She was 30 years old, both were accepted. That made her very happy. She was in, among only six women accepted for exhibition in the salon before 1870. And interestingly enough, she and Mary Cassatt were the first American women to exhibit in the Paris salon. I wanted to include these two paintings because, number one, I think they're charming and they're not typical of her normal body of work subjects, subject-wise. They share the same innocence that she captures in all of her work, but the subject matter is old, new and old love. I could speculate that she was anticipating her own very long engagement to Mr. Bouguereau, but they were commissioned by an American, um, Mr. Obed J. Wilson. They were based on a poem by Robert Burns. She completed them in... 1882. She and Bouguereau became engaged in 1879 and they married finally in 1896. We'll look more carefully at one of her paintings, which I also think is quite charming. The title of it is Bubbles. It was done in 1891. It's an oil on canvas. It's a genre painting in the academic traditional salon style. I describe it as depicting three figures, two young girls, and presumably their mother. The interaction is the three are playing with bubbles. The youngest is amazed and awed by the large bubble created by her mother, and the older child blows into the bowl of soapy water, creating more bubbles. It's set outside or on an open porch. The palette is light to dark neutrals, all grays, browns, and golds, and whites. Um, the dress is not contemporary. It's casual and rustic. The children are barefoot. It's a central pyramidal structure. The light enters from the upper left and it comes down and highlights the side of the mother's face looking at her daughter and leading to the younger child. And that's very much focuses on the expression of that wonder in that child's face in viewing the bubble. The upper half is showing the outdoors is viewed from the porch and the trio sitting there on the wall and window of the house. The bottom is almost in total shadow, with just a peak of the bare feet of the children and the young child as she leans against her mother. It's interesting that the trope of the bubble is meant in art is meant to convey the brevity or fragility of life. I can't tell for sure if that's if that's what Elizabeth wanted to do here, if she was just using it as a subject matter. It is a somber palette, but the feeling is romantic and idealistic. So did she want to represent the fragility of life. She lived a long life, but I don't know. Regarding the trope of the bubble in art, there's a lot of company. On the far right is Chardin's Bubbles. It was over a hundred years before Elizabeth. You can see though the style and palette is quite similar. 
Then we go on next to Millet's work, full of the romance and the wonder. Um, the style and palette are somewhat similar to Gardner, but um, the brush strokes are a lot more free and more painterly. Uh, the Jacob Maris, Two Girls Blowing Bubbles, is considered contemporary with Gardner. The sentiment is the same, but the Impressionist style is very apparent and quite different from Gardner's here. And of course, Manet was a contemporary of Gardner's. Their styles we know were very different. I would say here, their palettes are similar, but again, the paint application is quite different. I think it's important to mention some of um, Elizabeth's female contemporaries of the time, especially Mary Cassatt. They were almost exact contemporaries in age, and they share some interesting similarities, I believe. They're both born in the eastern United States. They arrived in Paris within two years of each other. They both remained in France for the remainder of their lives, visiting sporadically to the U.S. They both exhibited at the 1868 Salon, and they both trained, in part, by copying works in museums. They championed women's rights, and they both had the protection of a very well, a very well-known male artist, Gardner and Bouguereau, and Cassatt and Degas. They employed similar subject matter in their work: women and children, family, innocence, etc. But their work otherwise differed very greatly in style. Um, I would also say that Cassatt was partially supported financially by her family. Gardner, as I've said, supported herself as well as contributing support to her family. So maybe this difference in finance um, may have afforded Cassatt more freedom to experiment with the emerging Impressionist movement and conversely required Gardner to continue to create saleable works. I can't know for sure. Um, another contemporary was Rhoda, Rosa Bonhoeur. She and, and Elizabeth were friends and she considered her a mentor. She created a copy of uh, Bonhoeur's famous work, Plowing in the Nivernay. She was the one, um, Rosa was the, the woman who encouraged um, Lizzie to go ahead and dress as a man to get into the classes. She also suggested she enroll in sketching class at the Paris Botanical Gardens. Um, and when she did in 1867, there was a class of 37, half of whom were women. And other American artists were taking advantage of these animal study classes. And they were Thomas Eakins and Augustus St. Gaudens. She certainly also admired Rose's um, ability in business and her marketing. In this slide, I want to show a couple of things. One on the upper left shows the difference in style between Mary Cassatt and Elizabeth Gardner. You can see their subject matter is similar. Palettes are very different. Um, Cassatt, as you can see, is very experimental in composition and color and media. Um, she, her subjects are in contemporary clothing. Elizabeth's are in sort of a rural country look. And uh, Cassatt created the impression, not a detailed rendering, as did Elizabeth. Yet on the bottom right, I would show how um, Cassatt's style and coloring was very similar to her mentor, Edgar, Edgar Degas. They both worked in pastels, and they were both drawn to depicting acts of dressing or bathing. Um, not quite as thoroughly as the gardner Bouguereau uh, collaboration, but many Degas works could pass for Cassatt pieces and vice versa. Elizabeth was always realistic about her need to support herself, and she also felt she should contribute to her family as well in the United States. So she started making copies for pay um, immediately upon her arrival in Paris. She copied works in the Luxembourg and Louvre museums. Um, it was her principal source of income. She made a decent living from it, and she could that made, allowed her to pursue a continued training and her career. She was the first American artist known to support herself as a copyist in this way. She supplemented her income by writing salon reviews for American newspapers. She acted as purchase agent for collectors. And she produced smaller works of art for quick sales to tourists. These were called pot boilers, as they kept the pot boiling. Um, this earning the income was a continued preoccupation with her. Her correspondence shows that she was producing pot boilers, even when she was successful in her artistic career as late as 1894. I find this a big contrast to Mary Cassatt, her contemporary. We know that Cassatt's father was not totally supportive of Mary's career as an artist, yet she was supported financially by her family. Um, 
and her living expenses, her travel expenses, etc. But her father wanted her studio to pay break even. He said, this makes Mame very uneasy as she must either make sale of the picture she has on him or else take to pay, painting pot boilers, as the artists say, a thing she has never yet has done and cannot bear the idea of being obliged to do. So how did Elizabeth create this persona? Um, I, I call it this the modern um, term of branding. She wanted to create a very particular persona and profile. And to do so, she aligned herself with French male artists. And she wanted to make sure they were successful French teachers and mentors. And she wanted to keep good ties with known masters. She followed the academic style of traditional salon painting popular at that time, and she wanted to be known as an American artist residing permanently in Paris. And I find this interesting. She would not exhibit in women or American-only exhibitions. Um, she grew her artistic reputation with the American colony in Paris and with French artists. The salon acceptance in 1868 was very important. She wrote that the honor gave her at once a position among foreign artists and raises the value of what I paint. The ultimate signifier of success could result in more attention and higher pricing. The painting shown here was also accepted and awarded at the Salon of 1878. She says about this, my pictures at this year's Salon have just received the medal which I have waited for so many years. I hasten to write to you by the first mail for I know you will all sympathize with me in my happiness. The jury voted me the honor by a very flattering majority, 30 voices out of 40. No American woman has ever received a medal here before. You will perhaps think I attach more importance than is reasonable to so small a thing, but it makes such a difference in my position here, and I hope it will be a good thing for the sale of my paintings. Mr. Bouguereau is very happy at my success. Well, she, was brand she branded herself in a very particular profile, and so how did she continue that promotion? Very much, as, as using her studio as a marketing tool. Um, she held formal receptions. She invited dealers, journalists, members of the American Collie, and prominent French artists. Um, you can see over 100 guests at these, these um, salons. They function as social and professional networking to reinforce her position in the French art world. Um, Paris uh, editions of some of the American newspapers reviewed these gatherings, and when they did, Elizabeth made sure she sent them back to the U.S. as another means of keeping her name and work out there and relevant. Um, one such review mentioned the names and positions of guests emphasizing the prestige of the gathering. This was from 1893. They said, Miss Elizabeth Gardner's studio was yesterday afternoon crowded with visitors come to see the artist's new picture. But about 10 years before that, she was also doing salons, and she said in a letter to her sister Maria, on the 20th of March, I gave a reception in the afternoon inviting the best of my American friends. About 100 came, and it was the most brilliant thing I have ever done. A biographer described Gardner's studio sessions on the Notre Dame de Champs as the mecca of American travelers and art aspirants, attracted by the renown of her salon achievements. So you can see that salon achievements were very important in keeping her name out there. So this a photo that you see here was most likely a photograph taken of her in this setting, which certainly gives her, shows her as a professional, but she's still in kind of a feminine setting with a very lavish um, decor around her. These were used kind of as a, a visiting or a business card, and it created the impression of the dignified, successful professional, smartly attired amid lavish decor. We know Elizabeth was motivated by ambition and that need to provide a living for herself and her family, but she was very astute about putting her ideas into plans and executing those plans to maintain, create and maintain her artistic status. The American colony market really required cultivation, and she had to really maintain social protocols and propriety. She had that very long engagement to Bouguereau, which was unusual, but she was very careful about how she handled that and made sure that they were um, only seen in certain situations, as she's mentioned, and she hosted these studio receptions to maintain and expand her client base. She also expanded her reach when she sent paintings for exhibitions in the U.S., England, and Germany. She participated in exhibitions in the National Academy of Design in New York, 
and also at the World's Fairs of 1867 and 1893 in the U.S. Sometimes she worked as a special correspondent writing columns about the French art scene for the Boston Traveler, the Cincinnati Daily Gazette, and the Exeter Newsletter. She wrote that she um, stayed in Paris all this time because she feared going back to the U.S. frequently or returning there to live would she would be losing down ground in the competitive French art market. So she only came back in 1872 and 1876. So how did her sales go? Pretty well. Um, you know, she was an art advisor to American art collectors, and, and in doing this, she learned the workings of the European art market. She often recommended the work of academy masters such as Merle, Bouguereau, and Ger Jerome. She also acted as her own dealer in the early days, but she knew that she needed to establish relationships with both French and American dealers. She had dealers in Boston and in New York, in England, modestly, and in Paris, she, she worked with the dealer Albert Goupil, who helped her in the sale of her work in France. She very much relied on her American friends and relatives to send visitors to her studio. And she established those connections with the American embassy and therefore was able to attend official receptions. Here is a painting of hers, 1879, big year for her, engagement, etc. cetera. Um, and she sold this painting called Ruth for $1,200. Right or wrong, Elizabeth is always associated with Bouguereau. So a review of her life is just not complete without talking about their relationship and him himself. As I said, he's his teacher, mentor, fiance, finally her husband. She really showed great patience in the length of their engagement, which was 17 years due to his mother's opposition to the marriage. But she hung in there and she lived next door for many years. And I think she also kind of appreciated that, that she had some form of independence as well. She wanted to establish her artistic reputation and career on her own. Um, and we mentioned that her style and technique, almost indistinguishable from Bouguereau. She really admired him and she had no issue with that. As they were so close personally and professionally, collaboration, of course, is not only possible, but very likely. There's no indication that I have found that Gardner wanted to experiment in any other movements outside the academic style that she excelled in and is taught by Bouguereau. And in his time, he was considered one of the premier artists in France. I would say, again, her correspondence really gives us some insight into her personal feelings. Um, these, these are some um, notes she made to her family about Mr. Bouguereau. And she says, and now about my engagement, I'm very fond of Mr. Bouguereau, and he has given me every proof of his devotion to me. We neither of us wish to be married at present. I have long been accustomed to my freedom. I am beginning to attain a part of the success for which I have struggled so long. He is ambitious for me as well as I am for myself. As it is, I can't help working very much like him. I wish to paint by myself a while longer. He has a fretful mother who is now not young, 78, I think. She is of a peevish, tyrannical disposition, and I know she made his first wife much trouble. Mr. Bouguereau went with me to a party the other evening at the house of engaged of old friends of ours. It, is, it was our first time out together. We cannot have as good times here as engaged people in America. Long engagements are not customary, and we never drive together or do anything to attract attention. I am very happy in my future prospects, and so is he, but I have seen enough of the sorrows of life to be somewhat philosophical. And then a later interview in 1910, the interviewer reminded her that her work bore such a close resemblance to her husband and teacher, and she responded with this, that she would rather be known as the best imitator of Bouguereau than be nobody. So you can see she remained very loyal to Bouguereau and to the academic tradition, even as that was fading from popularity. So what can we say in conclusion about this woman's life and work? So interesting. She was a real master of balancing her ambition, her talent, her business skills, and she created this really a remarkable career. We should know more about her today. You know, in spite of the obstacles, the finances, and her gender pose, she just planned this out. And she said, I'm going to do this. To, and that's how she approached her training, her marketing, her sales. She demonstrated really shrewd business skills in the international art market as well. Now, her relationship with Bouguereau might have been used as an excuse to relax her high standards 
supporting herself. Yet she didn't let it do that. She continued working and doing her pot boilers long after they were married even. I would say she did not contribute to the canon of art history by striking out in a new direction or movement as to the avant-garde painters emerging at that same time that she was building her career. Yet she was very successful. She was recognized and awarded as one of the best artists of her time. I think her lasting contribution and legacy to art history is the story of her determination in the face of numerous obstacles that she created and maintained this really successful career in art. I would also say avant-garde means vanguard or the advanced guard. Those are the people and ideas that are ahead of their time. Usually it refers to an art movement or political group. But I would say that Elizabeth was the advance guard for women coming behind her. She was really an example of how to create a life and career in art. And I say thank you, Elizabeth, for your hard work.